At least one-third of Deer Lodge has been underwater since last night, thanks to Cottonwood Creek, which wiped out three bridges, drowned a herd of cattle, and left at least 200 homes in up to five feet of water. By sunrise, things were no better. If anything, they were worse. And Montana Power began turning off residential gas lines, and people were being advised to boil their water before drinking it. It will be several days before the damage can be properly assessed in Deer Lodge. Most of its residential district was affected by the flooding, while the downtown business area will be out of business, at least for the weekend. Then there are cleanup costs. It's going to put a lot of strain on the county budget. Probably my budget, too. Just in overtime alone, or are there other things? No, most of the work, as far as my budget is concerned, is volunteer. Uh, in fact, we had... Uh, about 12 trucks running steady all night long last night. We must have hauled at least 300 loads of gravel to different places in town. There's lots of people making sandbags for protection of homes and so forth. Deer Lodge residents do have one thing to be thankful for. The Clark Fork River, which runs through much of the city, stayed within its banks all day. Pat Anson, MTN News, Deer Lodge. Day four and round four of the special session saw the Republicans continuing to push through bills that would make only minor alterations in prison policy, the so-called Band-Aid bills. Democrats, on the other hand, continue to have trouble sponsoring Governor Schwinden's program, what has become known as the bricks and mortar legislation. The principal brick, a bill calling for a $9.6 million expansion at the existing prison, still lies tabled in the committee stage. But Schwinden says it isn't dead yet. I don't think it's dead, Pat. I, uh, we're going to continue to push for the entire package. I have every indication that uh, somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of our recommendations are going to be coming on down. Over in the Senate, Paul Boylan of Bozeman managed to revive a bill that would drastically alter the chain of command for Warden Hank Risley. Boylan wants Risley to report directly to Governor Schwinden instead of Institutions Director Carol South. That would streamline prison management, according to Boylan, but others saw it as an attempt to reduce South's influence on Risley. Uh, he is by no means a yes man uh, to Carol South, and I think that we will find Throughout this session, there's been a growing consensus that it's being hamstrung by politics, and ultimately, little will be accomplished. I had the feeling that, that, uh, that we could have done, that there could have been a great many things done out there uh, at, an administration, uh, at an, on an administrative level, which would have made this, this session unnecessary. The Republicans should, came, should have came here with an open mind and not... Uh, uh, have a, a set ideas before all of the, the, the programs were discussed. There's competing philosophies here that really haven't had time to work themselves out and exchange uh, ideas. It's, it's really kind of a crazy situation. Predictions on when the session might end now range from this weekend all the way to Tuesday. Pat Anson, MTN News, Helena. These games became a fixture in Montana, bars and arcades over the past few years. And this year their namesakes became a fixture in Montana politics. Sometimes they court the candidate and sometimes the candidate courts them. But either way, PACs now play a major role in the Montana political process. This year, PAC money accounted for a third of all the donations given to Montana's major party congressional candidates. Libertarians refused to accept PAC funds, although it's doubtful they were offered any. Broken down as a percentage of total donations, PAC money accounts for more than half of all the funds used in the Pat Williams and John Melcher campaigns. PACs have also become more active in state legislative races, where they have a history of picking winners. University of Montana professor Jim Lopatch. 64% of uh, PAC money went to candidates who won 
to winning candidates, which means once again that uh, the candidate who wins, who is now a legislator, will be grateful and will be open to a visit by a member of a PAC, and therefore they have clout. Certainly they, they all add up and do have an influence, but as far as any one group, uh, the energy industry or any other one industry, I think having uh, that much influence in any one candidate or any one particular uh, congressional race anywhere in the country, I think uh, would be to over-exaggerate that. Is John Melcher really in step with Montana? Easily the most active PAC in Montana over the past two years has been the National Conservative Political Action Committee. Melcher's campaign estimates Nick PAC spent more than $200,000 working for the senator's defeat. Pat Anson, MTN News, Great Falls. Isn't it time we sent him a message? Laboratory testing on animals over the past two decades has shown that Endrin has an acute toxicity in very low doses. It disrupts the central nervous system, causing dizziness, convulsions, and sometimes death. But the state agriculture department says there was little it could do in the spring to prevent wheat farmers from applying Endrin to their fields. It was a registered pesticide with the Environmental Protection Agency, indicating it was a safe pesticide when used properly. So the department did not consult with other state agencies. Was the health department ever brought into the decision process? Did someone from AG come over here and ask you about injury? To my knowledge, no. Did they consult with Dr. Drainan? He says not. Did they consult with anyone in this department? To my knowledge, no. The Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department was also kept in the dark, which prompted wildlife biologist Tom Massale to write a long memo to his superiors in April after the apparent endron caused death of several birds and fish. Massale complained that there was no pre-spray coordination among state agencies. He's saying that there was no cooperation. Uh, I guess I really don't have much reaction to that. If that's how he feels, I don't think he understands how the system works. Every time they decide to apply, they do not have to run to us or run the EPA or any state agency and ask for permission. Because if it's a registered pesticide, it's basically saying it's safe, and if they're properly licensed, then they have met the basic requirements of the state. Uh, we're now into a point where, uh, looking back on it, we're saying that the system didn't address this problem adequately. State officials all agree on two things now, that the cooperation between agencies today is excellent, and that, in hindsight, they should have taken a harder look at Endron before the spring began. Pat Anson, MTN News, Helena. Jefferson County Attorney Patrick Flaherty alleged that Sheriff Demers illegally accepted reward money from the state prison last November for helping to capture an escaped inmate in Powell County. Demers later returned the money, but Flaherty, who's been feuding with the sheriff for several months, maintained that acceptance was a violation of state law, a violation that should cost Demers his office. Gene Peacott, Demers' attorney, said that was nonsense and charged that Flaherty was conducting a vendetta against the sheriff. At times, his rebuttals seem more like that of a prosecutor than a defense attorney. Amazing. An absolutely astonishing thing <coughs> that a man with a license to practice law will stand up with a straight face in front of your honor and, and make I'm going to contention. object, your honor. The canons of ethics require that lawyers do not get into personalities and this mundane kind of trivia, and I wish Mr. Peacock would confine himself to legal arguments and not debase the dignity of this court with personal invective, such as he's done in his affidavit. The canons of ethics also require that an officer of this court does not stand up and deliberately misrepresent things to this court or lie to this court. And that's what's going on here as far as Mr. Flaherty is concerned. Judge Blair this afternoon granted a defense motion for summary judgment which effectively dismisses the case. Flaherty termed Blair's ruling as a quote, very off the wall decision and says he'll appeal to the state Supreme Court. Ironically, Blair today also heard opening arguments in Flaherty's appeal of his contempt of court citation in another case. A ruling on that is expected within 10 days. Pat Anson, MTN News, Boulder.
Presently, it's costing us in excess of a dollar a pound to produce copper, and the price last week was 76 cents. It was a purely economic decision for Anaconda, which has been losing as much as $3 million a month in Butte because of poor market conditions. 400 employees, a little less than one-fourth of the company's Butte workforce, are being laid off, effective this Sunday. 75 are from the Berkeley Pit and Weed Concentrator. Another 75 are office workers. And the bulk, 250, are from the Kelly Mine. Reopened only two years ago and, at the time, touted as the rebirth of under ground mining in Butte. Very little copper ore was actually coming out of the Kelly. Work for the most part was concentrated on widening shafts and removing old support beams. Although operations at the Kelly are being suspended indefinitely, Thompson says pumping and maintenance activities will continue, leaving open the possibility that it could be reopened on a later date. The earliest that would be, though, would be sometime next year. Things, I think, are going to get tougher before they get better, and I think that's a matter of us weaning ourselves <coughs> from, uh, from the results of uh, uh, previous policies uh, of the government. I guess it's another lesson in uh, dependence on, on large industry in this state, and uh, I think reinforces the need to diversify and strengthen the small business community in Montana. Yeah, it's going to be very hard on a lot of people. And we hate to see it, but uh, I think we have to believe them when they say they're trying to keep the Butte operations going, and, and we have to believe them when he indicates to us that it is a step to keep the Butte operations open instead of completely closing. Anaconda says it will go ahead with previously announced expansion plans at the Berkeley Pit, including construction of new molybdenum, lime slaking, and ore concentrating facilities. However, that won't help the 400 people being laid off. Pat Anson, MTN News, Butte. The Anaconda smelter in Anaconda is ranked by the EPA as the 46th most hazardous dump site in the country. Now that's out of thousands of other sites the agency has been studying over the past few years. But whether the smelter actually poses a threat to public health or the environment is something that's in dispute. MTN's Pat Anson reports in the second part of his series on the Anaconda Company's handling of its toxic waste. The Anaconda Company and the EPA spent several months last year taking water and soil samples in the Anaconda area. For the most part, the study focused on how the smelter and its slag piles were affecting ground and surface water. The testing found traces of over a dozen heavy metals, including dangerous ones like arsenic, lead, and mercury. But, as the company pointed out in its draft report, the levels showed substantial compliance with national drinking water standards. But the EPA may not go along with the company's conclusion. Anaconda measured the water only for dissolved metal content, ignoring the metals found in suspended particles. The drinking water standards Anaconda cites in its study are based on total metal content, dissolved and suspended. So the company may have been comparing apples with oranges. Typically, when you do a groundwater sample, you find very little suspended material. So quite often, people will run, run a dissolved metal instead of a total anyway. And so I don't know how erroneous it is. It, it's not completely correct. We, we should have some data to show both to see if there is a large difference between the two, a total and a dissolved. Only 10 soil samples were taken in the Anaconda area and areas downwind from the stack produced positive readings for arsenic, copper, lead, and zinc. But there are no health standards for soil, and so no one knows what's safe and what's not. Relating soil concentrations to impacts not only on, on uh, human health, but on environment. Uh, there really is this yardstick question that we, we raise. There's not anything specific that we have. Uh, we don't have those questions answered yet. That's an area that we definitely need to look much harder at, the soils. Anaconda, in keeping with its policy, is refusing comment about any of this. The company is very sensitive about publicity concerning the test results or its interpretation of them. More about that tomorrow. Pat Anson, MTN News, Great Falls. And a pro this week we've been telling you about the potential health hazards at the old Anaconda smelter and the Great Falls refinery. The Anaconda Company, the EPA, and the state have been examining both sites as part of a joint study agreement. 
Tonight, MTN's Pat Anson concludes his series on the study by looking at a part of it that has nothing to do with the public health or the environment. The study agreement is unique to begin with, but it also contains one very unusual clause concerning publicity. It was included at the insistence of the Anaconda Company and required all three parties to consult with each other about contacts with the press. The clause was so important to Anaconda, it made significant concessions in other parts of the study agreement. Why became apparent later on when Anaconda began using the clause to pressure the EPA about its press statements. For example, when the agency began putting together a news release announcing the agreement, its first draft said the study was designed to determine contamination at the refinery and smelter. But Anaconda maintained there was no contamination, so the EPA press release was changed to say the study was designed to determine the potential for contamination. The release then went on to praise Anaconda for its spirit of cooperation. That cooperation almost ended a few months later, when the Montana Standard printed an interview with EPA engineer Jim Dunn about the initial study results. Richard Crablin, an Anaconda official in Denver, was incensed. In a letter to the EPA's regional director, Crablin said the article was a violation of the study agreement and that Dunn's comments were idle speculation. Crablin added that Anaconda could consider this adequate grounds to withdraw from the agreement, despite the great amount of work already completed. The threat was an idle one. The company did not pull out of the study agreement, and the EPA continued to give interviews to the press. We have had a pretty good relationship with the, uh, the folks that are doing the, the, working with us on a day-to-day -day basis on the study. And uh, they, Mr. Crablin has is, is not been working with us on a day-to-day -day basis. So I don't know how serious he was. Why is Anaconda so sensitive about publicity and the study in general? They have an awful lot at stake. We're talking about spending their dollars to do a study that we want and that initially they uh, didn't feel was all that necessary. Let's assume that, that some type of action is needed both in Great Falls and Anaconda. How much is, it, is in stake in terms of a dollar figure for Anaconda? I couldn't even guess as to how much it might be. It could be uh, fairly large depending on what we decide needs to be removed or it could be more of a maintenance kind of thing, but even then you're talking about long-term maintenance. You know, essentially 50 to 100 years it could be, become somewhat expensive, but I, I have not seen any guesses on cost. And